Okay, our next speaker, I guess we could say presenter, is Dr. Paul Wilkinson from the British Isles, uh, from out just outside Manchester, England. And Dr. Wilkinson uh, has a PhD from the University of Manchester and wrote an excellent dissertation on Darby and Christian Zionism, which many of y'all have purchased and read uh, over the years. And uh, Paul is a wonderful uh, blessing to us the last six or seven years, right? You've been coming. And um, first of all, he's got a British accent, which for Texans... It's kind, of, it's kind of the opposite of our accent, right? <laughs> uh, and so he sounds so dignified, which, of course, because he is dignified, <laughs> which also is another opposite from Texans. <laughs> and uh, he uh, has, is having an increasing influence over there in England, and broader Great Britain for the cause of Christ, and we're happy to have him come. Now, he uh, went to Bethlehem Bible College in Bethlehem, Israel, not Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, and he uh, attended this Palestinian uh, Bible conference uh, on Israel, and he's going to give us a report of this because, of course, that fits into the idea of apostasy because of the replacement theology, which is apostasy, you know, started by the early church and on into the Roman Catholic Church, et cetera, and into many of our churches today. And uh, so he's going to give us a report of what happened there. So, Paul, come on and do it to it. Okay, thank you, Tommy, and uh, it is a blessing for me to be here again. My first time was 2007, and uh, I've been every year since, and it's a blessing to be uh, here again with my pastor's son, Samuel Robinson, and I bring you greetings from my home fellowship, Hazel Grove for Gospel Church just outside Manchester in England. Well, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this conference. Thank you for Tommy and Thank you for Dr. LaHaye and all those who are involved in putting this conference together year by year. Father, thank you for my brothers and sisters in Christ. And Lord, we just thank you for the provision of food that we've just taken of. And Lord, we pray for strength for the rest of the day and pray for just the guidance of the Holy Spirit in what we present and what we hear in this next session. Father, we worship you and we humbly submit our lives afresh to you this day. And we love you, Lord Jesus, our great God and Savior and the soon coming King. Praise your name. Amen. Well, at the beginning of this year, I received an email from Dr. Ice asking me if I was aware of a conference that was due to take place in March this year called the Christ at the Checkpoint Conference. And that was being hosted, organized by Bethlehem Bible College, which is um, the only evangelical Bible college in the so-called Palestinian territories. And uh, Dr. Ice asked me if I was aware of it and if I was willing to consider going to this conference. So I mentioned this to my pastor. We prayed, asked the Lord, and he had a good witness that I should be there. And uh, I'm going to share my experiences with you. And I'm going to let one of the main speakers who gathered in Bethlehem, and one of the main organizers behind this conference, introduce it to you from a rooftop in Bethlehem. You may recognize him. Uh, Most of you uh, will certainly be aware of his name. I'm standing on a rooftop in Bethlehem, and we are beginning to form the, the basis of an incredible conference in 2012, March 2012. There are going to be students gathering here, hundreds of evangelical leaders from the United States and around Europe. And what we want to do is convene here in Bethlehem and raise the question, what do we make of the occupation of the West Bank under Israeli control, and what should the Christian church in the West say to it? We hope that you're going to join us 
with hundreds of others to uh, create what is going to be perhaps the most important international gathering of Christians in 2012. That's some statement. And I think it was, for all the wrong reasons, one of the most significant gatherings of evangelical Christians this year. So, Bethlehem Bible, Bo Bible College, the host of the second Christ at the Checkpoint Conference. Bethlehem Bible College was founded in 1979 by this man, Bishara Awad. They have two campuses, one in Bethlehem, one in the Galilee. They have approximately 130 students. This is his more outspoken, perhaps more well-known brother, Alex Awad, describes himself as a Palestinian Methodist. Uh, he is Dean of Students at Bethlehem Bible College. Here are some of the organizers, men who were on the organizing committee. You see on the left, Reverend Dr. Stephen Sizer, Anglican, Evangelical Vicar from England. You see the top right, Sizer, with Steve Haas, Vice President of World Vision, and Muntha Isaac, the rising star at Bethlehem Bible College. And there's a picture of Stephen Sizer going through the checkpoint with his British passport. The college convened at the five-star Intercontinental Jassir Palace. And uh, I took my place with over 700 evangelicals. I went there as an observer, not as a sympathizer. And these are the grounds of the uh, Jassir Palace. And it's just through the checkpoint, one of the checkpoints between Bethlehem and Jerusalem. And uh, it's often mentioned in the same breath as the apartheid wall as uh, some Christians and leaders and politicians like to refer to it as the wall of separation or the separation barrier that Israel constructed to put an end to Palestinian suicide bombers that were indiscriminately blowing themselves up on Jerusalem, bomb on Jerusalem buses and uh, firing indiscriminately at Jewish civilians. That's a consequence of what the Palestinian um, people have, have done to the Jewish people over the years of that wall and let me just remind you the wall is 3% wall the rest of it is a fence or barbed wire there is Gary Burge sat against the wall and you can see exactly what he thinks about it it is an apartheid wall and what you're going to hear is a lot of propaganda a lot of rhetoric being presented by these evangelical Christians so, as I said, over 700 evangelicals gathered in March 2012. Here was the conference director, Muntha. He said this, One of the things that makes me really angry about many forms of Christian Zionism is its certainty. Muntha Isaac was in the UK just a couple of weeks ago speaking at Stephen Sizer's church and what I'm going to be doing during this presentation is just showing you some of the links the networking that's going on in a movement that I've described as Christian Palestinianism. Muntha Isaac introduced the first guest the first speaker at the checkpoint conference the prime minister of the Palestinian authority Dr. Salam Fayed who greeted us all with these words welcome to Palestine you have the opportunity to see what it is like for the Palestinian people to live under Israeli occupation. He was followed onto the platform by this man, the Roman Catholic mayor of Bethlehem, Victor Battese, who at one point in his, in his speech referred to the crucifixion of our Lord Jesus Christ and then said this, we the Palestinian people are also crucified now. Was followed onto the platform by the man on the right in that picture, Dr. Hannah Issa, the director of um, the Muslim Christian Institute for Protecting Jerusalem and the Holy Sites. Yeah, just pay attention to those words, Muslim Christian, because this movement is all about interfaith. This is what Dr. Issa had to say. Jerusalem is under occupation and the Palestinian people are under siege. He then brought us greetings in the name of this man. Remember, we are at an evangelical conference. We were brought greetings in the name of this man, the Grand Mufti, the Islamic Grand Mufti of Jerusalem, Sheikh Mohammed Hussein. 
who courted controversy in January this year when he attended the 47th anniversary celebration of the founding of Fatah. This is what the Grand Mufti had to say on that particular occasion and the video comes from the website of Palestinian Media Watch. You may be more familiar with Sheikh Mohammed Hussein's notorious predecessor, the Grand Mufti during the Holocaust years, Hajimin al Husseini. There he is in Berlin meeting his close friend and ally, Adolf Hitler urging Adolf Hitler to complete the job he had started in Europe by destroying all the Jews of the Middle East. So my question is, what is an evangelical vicar like Stephen Sizer doing in this photo opportunity with the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem and with a member of the Arab League? Well, Stephen Sizer is not averse to having his photo taken with rather suspect individuals, including Yasser Arafat, in 2004 and I shared a couple of years ago on this platform something of my experience at the fifth international Sabeel conference in Jerusalem where this photograph was taken well this photograph was taken in Ramallah in the Mukhtar where Arafat was uh, holed up by the Israelis for a number of years all smiles evangelical arch terrorists arms around one another and I'm grateful to Dr. Randall Price for sending me that photograph which is taken from Stephen Sizer's PowerPoint, one of his PowerPoint presentations and many of the photographs I'm using in his presentation are taken from Stephen Sizer's own website. He is quite happy for people to see him sharing platforms and having photographs taken with such men. I mentioned the Sibyl conference, there we all were in 2004 on the steps of the Temple Mount not known as the Temple Mount, really, by Christian Palestinianists, as I call them. The Al-Haram Al-Sharif is how the Muslims refer to that site. And there is the Grand Mufti who addressed us on that occasion and alleged that there was never a Jewish temple on that site. That is what the Palestinian Authority in the Islamic world have been doing for the last number of years, trying to break the connection between the Jewish people and land of Israel and specifically this important spot on God's earth in Jerusalem, his holy city. And there is Stephen Sizer on that occasion, one of the speakers. I've described Reverend Dr. Stephen Sizer as the undisputed champion of Christian Palestinianism. And I'm not referring to Palestinian Christians, but Christians who are on an anti-Israel, pro-Palestinian crusade. The left-hand photograph was taken in Toronto, Canada, 2010 at the 4th Annual Evangelical Muslim Dialogue Conference. That conference was sponsored by the World Islamic Call Society. The man who founded the World Islamic Call Society was Colonel Gaddafi. Stephen Sizer was one of a number of speakers, including Gary Burge, who you heard from a moment ago, and Donald Wagner, who I'll mention in a moment. On the right-hand side, that's Stephen Sizer in Tehran, 2007, before the cameras and microphones of the Islamic Republic News Agency, defending the Iranian President Mahmoud Ahmadinejad against accusations made by the Zionists, as he referred to them. Remember, Ahmadinejad in 2005, at his World Without Zionism conference, said that Israel must be wiped off the map. Here is Stephen Sizer in Malaysia, June last year. He was invited to speak on Malaysian television on behalf of Viva Palestine, a long-lived Palestine. They are the group that was behind the infamous Gaza flotilla in 2010 when the IDF soldiers descended from their helicopters onto the ship and they were met with a far from peaceful resistance on that occasion. Stephen Sizer asked the question, who are God's chosen people? and he gives this answer the assumption that the Jewish people are God's chosen people is so deeply ingrained to 
question it sounds heretical or anti-Semitic. That's because it is. <laughs> Stephen Sizer in May this year did a tour of New Zealand. He traveled around evangelical churches and Bible colleges. It was called the With God on Our Side Tour, sponsored by Tear Fund, a Christian humanitarian organization. A couple of years ago on this platform, I spoke about the With God on Our Side film documentary, which denounces Christian Zionism. It was produced by the man on the left, evangelical film producer Porter Speakman Jr. Stephen Sizer was one of the main contributors and interviewees on the With God on Our Side documentary. And I mentioned on that occasion how Stephen Sizer and Porter Speakman traveled the United States presenting the film and teaching against Christian Zionism in places like Princeton and Harvard, as well as many uh, Christian and Bible seminaries and colleges throughout the United States and throughout the United Kingdom. They even met at Stormont in Northern Ireland in 2010, on our this day, November 2010, in a room belonging to Sinn Féin. Christian Action Tear Fund. The man in the center is Steve Tollestrop, the chief executive. He said this during Stephen Sizer's talk, We stand with the Palestinian people as a whole project for Tear Fund. We see Christian Zionism as an attack on orthodoxy. Shortly after Stephen Sizer's tour, he did an interview with a Christian, evangelical Christian television program in New Zealand called Shine TV. Listen very carefully to this short clip and you'll know exactly where Sizer stands. Listen to the propaganda, listen to the rhetoric. For the last 50, 60 years, Israel has been ethnically cleansing the Palestinian territories, demolishing homes on a daily basis, uh, building illegal settlements on other people's land, creating an apartheid structure system of separate roads, separate schools, separate healthcare systems, uh, keeping the Palestinian three million people under military occupation for decades. And we're surprised that they resist that, uh, or they treat uh, Israel uh, in, in, uh, you know, as, as the enemy. We're surprised that they resist that. We're surprised that um, Palestinian terrorists indiscriminately fire rockets from Gaza into um, Israeli civilian areas to try and kill as many Jewish people as possible. We're surprised, says our evangelical vicar. What these people will do is they will denounce anything that Israel does, but they will never speak out against the violence that's perpetrated against Israel. And you can go on Stephen Sizer's website just the last couple of weeks. He's been interviewing people in Bethlehem about the recent escalation in Gaza. Not one of the evangelicals he interviews apportions any blame to the Palestinians, not even to Hamas. In August this year in London, a demonstration took place. It was called um, a demonstration and rally in support of Palestine to commemorate Al-Quds Day. Al-Quds is the Arabic name for Jerusalem. You'll see the quote there from Nelson Mandela, our freedom is incomplete without the freedom of the Palestinians. The rally took place outside the American Embassy in London. One of the speakers on that occasion was Steve Sizer. And without further ado, I'd like to invite Reverend Dr. Steven Sizer, who's a vicar and a writer, to come and uh, illuminate us with his thoughts. Can we uh, welcome him with a round of applause? Thank you. If we wish to do God's will, we will work and pray for our goods to become an inclusive city that reflects God's vision, a city of justice, peace, and reconciliation. Inshallah. Thank you. You heard what Stephen Sizer said at the very end? He used that term, inshallah. Where did he get that from? Straight from the Quran, Surat Al-Kaf, the cave, chapter 18, 23 to 24. And never say of anything, indeed I will do that tomorrow, except when adding, if Allah wills, inshallah. Remember your Lord when you forget. Why is an evangelical Christian quoting from the Quran to speak of the will of God? Well, it's very 
instructive when you go on the websites of some of these people to find exactly who to identify with, exactly who is influencing them, and who they recommend in terms of websites and, and Christian teachers and leaders. Just last week, even size a post on his website, a sermon by John Piper on Israel, Palestine, and the Middle East. John Piper is no friend of Israel. He doesn't understand God's word on a number of things, but especially regarding Israel. August 2012, Stephen Sizer posted a video clip by Bill Hybels, founder, director, pastor of Willow Creek Community in um, South Barrington, Illinois, uh, advertising his leadership summit. In August, Stephen Sizer wrote an article called Fasting from a Christian Perspective, Gave thanks at the end to John Piper, Bill Bright, and this man, Richard Foster, a Quaker from Denver, Colorado. 1978, he wrote that book, The Celebration of Discipline, which Christianity Today described as one of the top 10 most influential Christian books of the 20th century. Celebration of Discipline is all about spiritual formation, it's all about meditation, it's all rooted in Middle Age mysticism. 1988, Richard Foster founded Renovari, and there is the Renovari Spiritual Formation Bible he put together with Dallas Willard, Walter Brugman, and Eugene Peterson. It's now referred to as the Life with God Bible. 2009, Stephen Sizer wrote an article headlined, Five Books That Changed My World. One of the top five books that changed his world, that had the greatest influence on him, And upon his church, Christ Church, Virginia Water in the south of England, was Rick Warren's purpose-driven church. Earlier this year, Stephen Sizer was investigated by the police in England because on his Facebook page, he posted a link to an overtly anti-Semitic website called The Ugly Truth. The Ugly Truth posts articles like this, November 11th, 2011. Holocaust denier set for key role in Greek government, and there you have Homer Simpson rejoicing at the news. The British police did not find Stephen Sizer guilty. They did Stephen Sizer's bishop, who was called upon to investigate hate crimes linked with his website and blog pages. If Stephen Sizer had posted a link to an anti-Islamic website, I don't believe Stephen Sizer would be in his post today. Say what you like about the Jews. A month ago, on the 95th anniversary of the founding of, of, of the publication of the Balfour Declaration, November 2nd of November, in 1917, the Balfour Declaration was issued under the British government of David Lloyd George, On the 95th anniversary, a conference was convened in Edinburgh, Scotland, called the Britain in Palestine Conference. The organization that organized it, hosted it, was the Balfour Project in association with the Church of Scotland. One member of the steering committee of the Balfour Project, one of the speakers on that occasion, was Stephen Sizer. What the Balfour Project is seeking to do is call upon the British government to repent of ever issuing such a declaration that promised a homeland for the Jewish people. There is Stephen Sizer speaking about the road to Balfour in Edinburgh. And from Edinburgh, Stephen Sizer flew out to Wheaton College, Illinois for an evening headlined, The Holy Land for One or All. Stephen Sizer, his theology is rooted in traditional historic replacementism or supersessionism, even though he denies it. His theology is that God has replaced Israel with the church, or as they like to rephrase it now, they believe in fulfillment theology. Jesus is the fulfillment of Israel. Jesus is the fulfillment of the temple. He's the fulfillment of Jerusalem. He's the fulfillment of all the promises relating to the restoration of the Jewish people to the land. Well, back to Bethlehem, to the Christ at the Checkpoint Conference. There is Sizer with Dr. Gary Burge. There's Porter Speakman. 
Sally Manaya, one of the conference organizers, and Ben White, an English journalist. Let me go back to Gary Birch. Gary Birch presented a paper on that occasion, Theology of the Land in the New Testament, in which he began by saying this, This country, Israel, may be the only place in the world where millions of people have chosen to justify their claim on land by appealing to a single man who died somewhere around 2000 BC, and they are dead serious. He went on, immediately some of my friends will accuse me of replacement theology or supersessionism. Gary Burge is a supersessionist. He believes in replacement theology. But what these men are trying to do is throw off that tag, throw off that label and beguile the wider, broader evangelical community by saying, we don't believe this at all. We don't believe that the church replaced Israel. And so what Gary Burge did in Bethlehem was present a new term, messianic fulfillment. It's just the same old theology in new garments. Gary Burge didn't say anything different, but he's trying to convince a wider audience that he is, you know, lining up with traditional evangelical theology in relation to the land of Israel. Here was another speaker on that occasion, Colin Chapman. 1983, he published this book, which has had a devastating impact on many evangelicals in this country. Whose Promised Land? Question mark, the continuing crisis over Israel and Palestine. This is what Colin Chapman said in Bethlehem. I have begun to understand a little of the anger that led to 9-11. I have to say that if I were a Muslim, if I were an Arab, I would feel some of this anger. And I would have to add that in many cases, I believe they have good reason to be angry. Colin Chapman describes himself as an evangelical Christian. Here were two of the other prominent speakers, Lynn Hybels, wife of Bill Hybels, Willow Creek, and John Ortberg, pastor of a large church in California, graduate of Fuller and Wheaton College. He's part of the spiritual formation movement. He gave the early morning Bible studies at the conference, and he tweeted after the conference that he had spent or had had an unforgettable trip to the Christ at the Checkpoint conference in Bethlehem, particularly singling out Gary Burge's presentation. Here was another speaker at the conference, Pastor Joel Hunter, 15,000 megachurch in Florida. In 2006, he was elected to be the president of the Christian Coalition. He resigned that post because the Christian Coalition wouldn't adopt the broader agenda he wanted to bring in regarding climate and poverty and things like that. For those of you that don't know who Joel Hunter is, apart from the things that I've just shared, He's also a spiritual advisor to President Barack Obama. These were influential people that gathered in Bethlehem in March. This is Sangbok David Kim. He's the president of the World Evangelical Alliance, which claims to represent 600 million evangelicals worldwide. At one point during his address, he specifically spoke to the Palestinians present and said, We feel the pain for you. This is Doug Birdsall. He's the chief executive of the Lausanne movement. Lausanne was the brainchild of Billy Graham in the 1970s, um, ably assisted by the late evangelical theologian John Stott. This is what Doug Birdsall had to say on that occasion. God has brought to Bethlehem, quote, the best minds of the church. One of those minds being Tony Campolo. Tony Campolo didn't say a great deal explicitly to do with Israel. For those of you not familiar with his writings, and he is one of the emerging church gurus, um, he was unofficially tried for heresy uh, in the mid 1980s. Very controversial figure. This is what he said in Bethlehem I do understand the kind of praying. You say nothing and you hear nothing, but in quietness and stillness, you center down on Christ. That's emerging church speak, spiritual formation. And you wait patiently for the Spirit to flow in and to envelop you and penetrate you and saturate you with His or her presence. 
Do you think any of the 700 evangelicals made a protest at that point? No, many of them laughed on that occasion as they did at a number of statements Tony Campolo made. One of the most disturbing developments was the presence of these three men on the platform. They are three of the leaders within the Messianic Jewish community. They were warned by the International Messianic Alliance not to attend, but they chose to attend. They were invited to share the platform. Evan Thomas, pastor at Beit Asaf in Israel. Wayne Hilsden, pastor of King of Kings Community in Jerusalem. Richard Harvey, former president of the International Messianic Jewish Alliance. They were embraced by the organizing committee, which is largely Palestinian. Uh, Wayne Hilsden did a good job to an extent, talking about Israel's place biblically within God's purposes. Uh, Richard Harvey broke down in tears at the end of his speech because he was given a standing ovation and all the organizing committee surrounded him and embraced him. And I've described this adopting and using uh, the title of one of Dave Hunt, Tom McMahon's books, The Attempted Seduction of Messianic Christianity. Because what speaker after speaker did from the platform in Bethlehem was say this, we love the Jewish people, but we hate Israel. We love the Jewish people and we've been to Auschwitz, but we hate Israel. We love the Jewish people, we've been to Auschwitz, we've even been to Yad Vashem in Jerusalem. But we do not recognize the state of Israel as having anything to do with God's prophetic purposes. You cannot love a Jewish person and hate the state of Israel. It's an oxymoron. They don't go together. And yet, this is, the, this is the ploy being used by the Christ at the checkpoint people trying to win leaders within the Messianic community now to their cause. Bridge building, reconciliation, listening to one another's narratives. That's what I heard time and again. This is the new president of Bethlehem Bible College, Jack Sarah. He closed the conference by reading from Ezekiel 37. The valley of the, dry bro- valley of the Dry Bones prophecy. This is what he said as he opened his Bible and read from Ezekiel 37. The hand of the Lord was on me and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of the West Bank. Bethlehem, Calchilia and Janine and Salvit and Nablus and Ramallah. It was full of bones. He asked me, Son of man, can these bones live? Can the Palestinian people live? That is replacement theology, as Tommy just said. In July, Hank Hanegraaff, president of the Christian Research Institute, invited Gary Bitch to come up to his program and talk about the Christ at the Checkpoint Conference in Bethlehem and about the With God on Our Side DVD, which Hank Hanegraaff wanted to promote. You're going to listen to a few extracts from that radio recording. The reason I want to talk to Dr. Gary Burge is we are attempting all this month to bring a big issue to the fore. It is encapsulated in a DVD with God on our side. And I want to set up this interview by simply pointing out that biblical theology knows nothing whatsoever of racism. Nor does biblical theology justify ethnic cleansing based on the pretext of a promise made to Abraham. Listen to what Hank Hanegraaff says about Genesis 12, 1 to 3. Is it really true that those who bless Israel will be blessed of the Lord, those who curse Israel will be cursed of the Lord? Or maybe put another way, what do we mean biblically when we talk about Israel? That's exactly the a great first question. Is it really true? Let me just change the wording. Did God really say? We know where that kind of question comes from. This is what happened when Hank Hanegraaff and Gary Burge discussed Acts 1, 6-8. Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? We have labored under the same misconceptions that the disciples labored under. They're grievous misconceptions. The disciples expected Jesus to establish Israel as a sovereign Jewish state. In fact, that notion was so ingrained in their psyches 
that even as Jesus was about to ascend into heaven, remember them asking him, Jesus, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? What does Jesus do? He not only corrects their erroneous thinking, but he expands their provincial horizons from a tiny strip of land on the east coast of the Mediterranean Sea to the far reaches of the world. This is how the interview concluded. Dr. Gary Burge, we deeply appreciate your work and your courage. May God continue to richly bless you, use you for His glory and for the extension of His kingdom. Thanks, Hank, and God blessings on your great ministry. I'm really glad you're there. You're doing fantastic work. We all uh, really look for, look up to you and, uh, and count on you uh, clearing the fog on so many important issues. Hank Hanograph has an eschatology issues package his website. You can see some of the books there. Gary Burge, Whose Land, Whose Promise, Stephen Sy, Zionism, Roadmap to Armageddon, Colin Chapman, Whose Promised Land. And I want to introduce somebody I've already mentioned who is also a close friend and an avid supporter of Gary Burge. This is Bill Hybel, September 2010. Good morning, everybody. Uh, this coming Saturday at 8 o'clock, you're going to have a real treat. A very close friend of mine who we use a lot around here at South Barrington, Dr. Gary Burge, is going to be speaking at a special breakfast that's coming your way. And you're not going to want to miss this. A common word. This leads me in to a document that was published in 2007 called A Common Word Between Us and You. This is the website for A Common Word. It's been described as the most successful Muslim Christian interfaith initiative in history. It was drawn up by 138 Islamic clerics representing all different branches of Islam. It followed statements made by Pope Benedict concerning the history of Islam in the Middle East. These Islamic scholars came together and they were trying to say we have a common word and that word is that God is a God of love and we are to love our neighbor. The chief architect behind this document which was sent to all Christian denominations throughout the world, all, all the mainstream and non-mainstream denominations, all their leaders. This document was sent to them in 2007. The chief architect was this man, Prince Ghazi bin Mohammed bin Talal. He is the religious advisor to King Abdullah of the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan. I'm going to read something from the Common Word document. The future of the world depends on peace between Muslims and Christians. Thus, in obedience to the Holy Quran, we as Muslims invite Christians to come together with us on the basis of what is common to us, which is also what is most essential to our faith and practice, the two commandments of love. In October that year, a group of so-called Christian academics came together at Yale University and issued a document called Loving God and Neighbor Together, a Christian Response to a common word between us. There is the website and the preamble in which they said this, as members of the worldwide Christian community, we were deeply encouraged and challenged by the recent historic open letter signed by 138 leading Muslim scholars, clerics, and intellectuals from around the world. At Fuller Theological Seminary in California, April 2009, the third evangelical Christian Muslim consultation was held headlined, A Common Word Between Us and You. One of the speakers on that occasion was Stephen Sizer. Where do they get this phrase, a common word from? Once again, right out of the Quran, Surah Ali Imran 3.64. Say, people of the book, and that's referring to the Jews and Christians, come to a word common between us and you, that we shall serve none but Allah, and shall associate none with him in his divinity, and that some of us will not take others as lords beside Allah. And if they turn their backs from accepting this call, tell them, bear witness, that we are the ones who have submitted ourselves exclusively to Allah. One of the main men that has endorsed this document, well, here are four of them. I'm jumping ahead there. Here are four of the men that have signed the Christian response, loving God and neighbor together. Christopher Wright took over from John Stott 
uh, as head of the Langham Partnership based in London, Colin Chapman I mentioned before, Manfred Cole, he was one of the organizers and speakers at the Checkpoint Conference and Sally Manaya likewise. But one of the main political voices in support of this document has been Tony Blair. There he is speaking at a Common Word event at Georgetown University. Now I'm going to mention some names now that have signed up to this document, not to mention all, pretty much all, the mainstream churches which have signed up to this document, maybe with some qualifications, but I'm going to mention some of the key leaders within the church. Where they stand with the Lord is not for me to, to say. They include Rick Warren. They include Bill Hybels. They include emerging church guru Brian McLaren. They include David Yonghe Cho, pastor of the world's largest church in Seoul, South Korea. They include Leith Anderson, president of the National Association of Evangelicals. They include Jim Wallace. They include the late John Stott. A couple of weeks ago, I was in the old city of Jerusalem and I came to the gates of the Mosque of Omar. I looked through the gates and this is what I saw from the Quran. Jesus said, I am indeed a slave of Allah. Allah is my Lord and your Lord, so worship him alone. Quran chapter 3, 51. There is nothing in common whatsoever between Islam and true biblical Christianity. Kairos, Palestine. 2009, the Palestinian church, as they call themselves, issued Kairos, Palestine, a moment of truth. It was based on the Kairos document that was published in 1985 by 150 black South African theologians in Soweto in which they called upon the church worldwide to stand against apartheid in South Africa. The Palestinian church have adopted and adapted that document and they've called it Kairos Palestine, a moment of truth. Three of the main compilers of that document are Naima Teek, founder of Sabil, the Palestinian Ecumenical Liberation Theology Center, Mitri Raheb, pastor of the Christmas Evangelical Lutheran Church in Bethlehem, and Johanna Catanacho. He's the academic dean, and he was one of the sp- academic dean at Bethlehem Bible College, and he was one of the speakers at the Checkpoint Conference. Here are two extracts from the Kairos Palestine document. 2.5 The Israeli occupation of Palestinian land is a sin against God. 4.2.1 The aggression against the Palestinian people, which is the Israeli occupation, is an evil and a sin that must be resisted and removed. Here is Stephen Sizer's website, March 2012, in which he's promoting this study booklet, a three-week congregational study plan of Kairos, Palestine. That booklet was produced by the Israel-Palestine Mission Network of the Presbyterian Church, USA. They're making a big push right now. Kairos Palestine Christmas 2012. They want all the churches to get on board. In June this year, a number of churches here in the States, Christian leaders here in America came together and they formed Kairos USA and issued the US response to the Kairos Palestine document. Here is a short extract. We begin with a confession of sin to Palestinians in the state of Israel, the West Bank, Gaza, East Jerusalem, the Diaspora, and in refugee camps in Gaza, the West Bank, Lebanon, Jordan, and Syria. As U.S. Christians, we bear responsibility for failing to say enough when our nation's ally, the state of Israel, violates international law. Here is the website of Kairos USA. Here is the program director, Mark Braverman, a Jewish American. There is his recent book, Fatal Embrace, Christians, Jews, and the Search for Peace in the Holy Land. I'm now going to introduce you to some of the main signatories of the Kairos USA document. Gary Burge, professor of New Testament, Wheaton College, Illinois. 
Donald Wagner, ordained Presbyterian minister, North Park University, Chicago. Tom Gibson, former vice president of World Vision. Walter Brugman, Old Testament scholar. He's part of the emerging church setup. Shane Claiborne, there he is. He was one of the speakers at the Checkpoint Conference. There he is with Stephen Sizer. He's part of the new monasticism movement, works closely with Tony Campolo, spiritual formation and all that. And Brian McLaren is one of the signatories as well. And I shared this quote a couple of years ago from Jerusalem, January 2010. This was Brian McLaren's blog. This morning I'll be back in East Jerusalem with the good people of Sabeel. While at Sabeel, it was a pleasure and honor to finally meet Matik, whose work and writings I have long admired from a distance. Naeem is a Palestinian signatory to an important statement called the Kairos document, created by Christian leaders across denominational lines across Palestine. You can add your name to it as I have. Brian McLaren right now is conducting a tour of the United Kingdom. It's called the Peace, Love and Misunderstanding Tour, in which he's promoting his new book, Why Did Jesus, Moses, the Buddha and Muhammad Cross the Road? I find that deeply offensive. When Brian McLaren returns this week from the UK, he will be speaking at this conference in Dallas-Fort Worth, What is church? It may be different than you think. Brian McLaren refers to himself as having once been a Christian Zionist. In fact, he was raised, if I remember correctly, within the Plymouth Brethren. What happened to Brian McLaren? Or perhaps what didn't happen to Brian McLaren? Kairos, Palestine, Sabeel, Christ at the checkpoint, all these speakers I've mentioned are putting their weight behind the global boycott, divestment, sanctions movement, or BDS, that was established by the Palestinian Civil Society in 2004. And by BDS, I mean boycott, divestment, sanctions against Israel. The Christ at the checkpoint conference took place during the 8th annual Israeli Apartheid Week. I don't know if you were aware there was thing. There were rallies on university campuses and in major cities right around the world in support of boycott, divestment and sanctions against Israel. Here is Naim Atik, head of Sabeel, last year in Jerusalem being interviewed by Stephen Sizer talking about BDS and the success that this movement is having in churches here in the United States. Now I see greater emphasis on BDS in the last three conferences. BDS means boycott, divestment, and sanctions. In the three conferences that we had, uh, we've had more people than usual. In Seattle, over 400 people. In San Francisco, over 500. They had to stop the registration. Uh, uh, in Hawaii, obviously smaller group, uh, but people are emphasizing now BDS and feel that uh, that's the way forward. Next year, Sabil will be celebrating the 25th anniversary of Palestinian liberation theology. It's really 25 years since Naimatik published this book, Justice and Only Justice, a Palestinian theology of liberation. Very quickly, by way of summary, what is a Palestinian theology of liberation? Well, in the words of Naim Atik, it's all about Jesus of Nazareth, the humanity of Jesus of Nazareth, who was also a Palestinian who lived under occupation. The Tampa Bay Times, Tuesday, May the 1st, 2012, ran an article by this man, Archbishop Desmond Tutu. Desmond Tutu is the patron saint they're my words, the international patron of Sabeel. This is what he said in that article. A quarter, of, a quarter century ago, I barnstormed around the United States, encouraging Americans to press for divestment from South Africa. Today, the time has come for similar action to force an end to Israel's long-standing occupation of Palestinian territory. February this year, 
University of Pennsylvania hosted the nationwide BDS conference. It began with this video greeting from Desmond Tutu. I greet you, dear friends, from South Africa. We are free today in this land because so many of our friends throughout the world supported us. And especially was it the case that students in your country were part of the divestment movement. They were able to change the moral climate in your country. They were able to change the moral climate in your country. That is exactly what the Christian Palestinianist movement is doing within the church. All those associated with the Bethlehem Bible College conference, they are changing the moral climate within the church. And notice his emphasis on students. Gary Burge brought over 30 of his students from Wheaton College to the Checkpoint Conference. Tony Campolo, Shane Claiborne, they did the same from Eastern University, St. David's, Pennsylvania. There is a big move on the campuses to get Christian students on board with the Palestinian agenda that is rooted in replacement theology and its new, newest um, metamorphosis liberation theology. 2009, the Central Committee of the World Council of Churches issued a statement on Israeli settlements in the occupied Palestinian territory calling for an international boycott of goods produced in the illegal Israeli settlements in the occupied territories. The World Council of Churches is the largest ecumenical body representing the church in the world today. That was the document and the illegal occupation of Palestine which it sent to all its members back in 2002. May this year, the United Methodist Church called for a boycott of products made by Israeli companies operating in occupied Palestinian territories. July this year, the Presbyterian Church passed a boycott motion supporting the BDS movement. That um, statement there was issued by Friends of Sabeel North America. They are very influential here in the United States. Next year, April 2013, they will be holding a conference in the L.A. Orange County area. Again in April, they will be in San Diego. They'll also be holding a conference in Chicago later in the year. Friends of Sabeel, North America, are very active. August this year, the United Church of Canada, Canada's largest mainstream church, also issued a resolution calling for a boycott of products produced on so-called illegal Israeli settlements. Here is Stephen Sizer again. He describes himself as an active member of the Palestine Solidarity Campaign. That is not a Christian organization, but many Christians, many churches are on board with this BDS agenda. There's the slogan, don't buy into the Israeli occupation. I'm going to take you to Edinburgh just a couple of months ago, September, when the Palestine Solidarity Campaign rallied to protest against the Israeli Batsheva Dance Company. Here's a short clip of what took place on that occasion in Edinburgh, Scotland. Palestine will be free. take you to Brussels, November 2010. What we're seeing in recent years is a phenomenon known as flash mob, where groups of people rendezvous in certain public places at a particular time to make their protest known, and there's nothing the security can do to stop it. Here is Brussels, a shopping center, shopping mall in Belgium, November 2010. My God, We take you to London, England, a supermarket as we call it, March 2011. 
could show you many clips, just two more. Brisbane, Australia, the main shopping mile, June 2011. People going about their daily business. A rendezvous has been arranged outside an Israeli shop selling Dead Sea products. <laughs> to Portland, Oregon, May 2011. Hey, what are you doing? Just shopping. You can't buy those. Why not? Because those products support Israeli apartheid. Oh, no! somebody not that long ago who was saying the very same thing to the people of his country. In einem kühnen und grandiosen Schwung haben wir die Feinde des Landes zu Paaren getrieben. Um 10 Uhr hat der Bagot begonnen. Er wird bis um die Mitternachtstunde fortgesetzt. Er vollzieht sich mit einer schlagartigen Wucht, aber auch mit einer imponierenden Manneszucht und Disziplin unserer Partei und unser Führer Heil! the boycott ended. First thing Adolf Hitler did in 1933 when he came to power was instruct his minister, minister for propaganda Joseph Goebbels to call for a nationwide boycott of Jewish goods. Nobody 
at that time had any idea where that boycott would lead. The same satanic, demonic, antichrist spirit that drove that boycott back then, 80 years ago, is driving, in my opinion, the BDS movement today. And many within the church, within the evangelical church, who are on board with this, they have no idea what they are doing. This is a photograph taken of Ordruff concentration camp, part of the Buchenwald complex, the first camp liberated by U.S. troops in 1945, with Generals Eisenhower and Patton looking on. In 1977, in a Dutch newspaper called Trouw, I don't know how you pronounce that, James Dorsey interviewed Zohair Moysen. He was at the time an executive committee member of the PLO, Yasser Arafat's organization. This is what Zohair Moysen said in that interview. The Palestinian people do not exist. The creation of a Palestinian state is only a means for continuing our struggle against the state of Israel and for our Arab unity. In reality, today, there is no difference between Jordanians, Palestinians, Syrians, and Lebanese. Only for political and tactical reasons do we speak today about the existence of a Palestinian people. For tactical reasons, Jordan, which is a sovereign state with defined borders, cannot raise claims to Haifa and Jaffa, while as a Palestinian... I can undoubtedly demand Haifa, Jaffa, Beersheba, and Jerusalem. However, the moment we reclaim our right to all of Palestine, we will wait not even a minute to unite Palestine and Jordan. So what I've described in this presentation is in effect a worldwide web or network that is drawing, connecting up all kinds of individuals, churches, denominations, organizations, and false religions with a common word of hatred against Israel. To use a term that my pastor, Andrew Robinson, has used at Hazel Grove for Gospel Church, these people are adopting a dragnet approach. They are just trawling in, sweeping in anyone, anything that will stand in opposition against Israel and the alleged occupation of Palestinian land. You can get a flyer on uh, my table out there. There are a couple of documents. Um, this one, the Church at Christ Checkpoint, I produced with the help of my pastor after attending that conference in March. And Prophets Who Prophesy Lies in My Name last year, Christian Palestinianism and the Anti-Israel Crusade, they are freely available to you. In November this year, I was invited to speak about uh, my work on Christian Palestinianism in Jerusalem. Um, I went to this consultation, and I was also asked to give a Christian response to Rabbi Shlomo Riskin's opening address. He was appointed by Benjamin Netanyahu as the Israeli ambassador for Jewish-Christian relations. On that occasion, I was able to speak out against interfaith, against ecumenism in the wrong sense of the word, and speak about who the Lord Jesus Christ is. The Jesus of the Bible, the Jesus we know and worship and love. Not the Jesus of Islam, not the Jesus of Roman Catholicism, not the Jesus of the Palestinian church that has rejected Israel, not the Jesus of the emerging church or the evangelical church that describes our Lord as a Palestinian refugee living under occupation. This scripture is foundational to our ministry as a church at Hazel Grove. Jeremiah 31. Hear the word of the Lord, O nations. Declare it in the coastlands far away. Say, he who scattered Israel will gather him and will keep him as a shepherd keeps his flock. And I want to finish, as I do every year, I want to finish, and thank you for your patience, with a song, again, that the Lord put on, my, on the heart of my pastor, Andrew Robinson. And it's not really a song, it's a prayer. It's taken from Isaiah chapter 6, when God said, Whom? Can I send? Who will go for us? Who will speak out against the apostasy in Israel and in Judah? Who will go for the Lord? It's called, Here Am I, Send Me. And with this, I hand back to Tommy. Yeah. 
Graham Moyer, um, our music leader at Hazel Grove, the words of our pastor, Andrew Robinson. But the message, the call is from the Lord God. And uh, may we go for him. May we stand and be sent as he would take us to proclaim the truth of his word and especially concerning the return of his son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Thank you, Paul. Now that is apostasy. Uh, and I want to thank Paul for going over there and keeping us track since he's in the neighborhood relative to us and reporting on this. I mean, no one could do a better job of reporting on this than you've done, not only here, but the Sibyl Conference and other activities, and we appreciate that, Paul. Uh, any questions or comments here? Okay, it's time to get started here as we get ready for our last presenter before our wonderful, exciting banquet for this evening. The last presenter before the rapture, I hope. Yes, or maybe the rapture will take place during your presentation. We all hope for that for any time like that. So as people gather back in. Yeah, our next, are you ready, Bruce? Okay. Our next presenter is Mike Gendron, who I first met when he was at that church in Plano. I don't know, what was it called? Fellowship Bible Church North. Yes. And, uh, he was uh, working with Gene Getz on his staff, and he had recently, I think, back then, graduated from Dallas Seminary. And uh, because of his Catholic background, he uh, had a real burden to evangelize Catholics because being saved in his 30s, he went through 30, 35 years of not knowing the gospel as a Roman Catholic. And so, God has risen up through him a ministry uh, to specifically focus on evangelizing Roman Catholics. Now, he'll evangelize anybody, but his focus of his ministry is to evangelize Catholics. And the American Bible Society printed just the best track I've ever seen uh, showing the difference between Roman Catholic view of salvation and the biblical view, and he's got it in two little charts, and I think it's part of this presentation at the end there. Right. And this is so effective uh, to show a Catholic what their faith teaches about salvation and then comparing it with Scripture. It's just excellent. In fact, it's good for non-Catholics as well because many non-Catholics are into works just as much as anybody else. So he's going to give us a talk about, you know, what's, ha uh, what's happening with uh, Rome, you know, in these last days of apostasy, right? That's right. Thank you. Thank you, Tommy. And thank you, Tommy, for inviting me to deliver a message that is near and dear to my heart. I have been laboring in this field that is white for harvest for over 20 years now. We've seen a whole lot of fruit, but we've also seen a lot of persecution it's been my joy to equip Christians throughout the world to reach out into this huge mission field that we know is the Roman Catholic religion. So let's begin by going to the throne of grace, shall we? O Holy Father, the one and only Holy Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for your prophetic word. Father, may you be glorified as we look at church history and see your sovereign control and protecting the true church. We thank you, Father, for the opportunity to contend earnestly for the faith in this time of great deception. We ask that you glorify our Lord Jesus Christ as we proclaim the true gospel this afternoon. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to look at Roman Catholicism's drift into apostasy. As we contend for the faith in these last days, 
we need to be keenly aware of the growing apostasy and the expanding ecumenical movement. God's word warns us that apostasy, which began in the first century, will continue to increase throughout the church age. And as apostasy accelerates, it will be a definitive sign that the church age is coming to an end. Throughout church history, in fact, even in the last hour, we have seen professing Christians, churches, denominations, and seminaries depart from the faith and drift into apostasy. As discouraging as this may be, we need to recognize that it's also encouraging because as the false converts fall away from the true church, the Lord is preparing his bride, preparing his bride for the wedding feast of the Lamb. And so that should be an encouragement to all of us. So I want to ask you a question as we begin. How would you define the Roman Catholic Church? Would you call it the only true church, as Pope Benedict XVI described it several years ago? Or would you call it a Christian denomination with significant error, as does most of evangelicals today? Or would you describe it as an apostate church with a veneer of truth hiding a false and fatal gospel? The Roman Catholic Church claims to be the one true church, in fact, As you see numbers in parentheses, that refers to the paragraph numbers of the Catechism of the Catholic Church. So this is not Mike Gendron's opinion. I'm sharing with you the official authoritative source of the Roman Catholic religion. The Catholic Church claims to be the one true church founded by Jesus Christ on the rock of Peter. It dares to say that the Catholic Church is necessary for salvation and has the authority to act in the power and place of the Lord Jesus Christ. It claims to possess infallibility in the areas of divine revelation, doctrine, and morals. It declares its bishops have the sole authority to interpret Scripture, which means you and I don't have that authority. We must go to the bishops of the Catholic Church. It also claims to administer the sacraments that are necessary for salvation. It claims to be the minister of redemption as it applies the merits of Christ and the saints to its members. So in the next hour, we'll see how apostasy is the result of Satan's relentless attacks on the church. We'll also look at four steps that characterize a church's drift into apostasy. Then we'll look at the history of the church, a chronological development of the Roman Catholic religion and its drift into apostasy. Then we'll look at the major Christian doctrines that the Roman Catholic Church has departed from. And lastly, and most importantly, what are you and I to do in the midst of this great apostasy and the growing ecumenical movement? As we look at apostasy in the church, Tommy has already explained to you the two Greek words mean to stand away from. We see individual apostates who gain influence and power, and they will eventually lead churches, parachurch ministries, denominations, and seminaries into apostasy. Satan is the one who initiates apostasy, and he does it as a most effective weapon to destroy the church of Jesus Christ. Apostasy, then, can be defined as a diabolical movement away from the faith that takes place within the Lord's church. Satan's influence in the church is described very well by John Owen, 17th century Puritan. He said, Satan blinds people's minds, inflames their lust, pours out his temptations, involves them in false and corrupt reasoning, transforms himself into an angel of light, uses signs and wonders to support his delusions. He never tires. He's always at work. Satan's all-out assault on the Christian faith is evidenced by the number of key doctrines that he undermines with his ministers of unrighteousness. And I want to share with you some of those assaults on the major Christian doctrines. His first assault is on the supremacy of God's Word, and that happened initially in the Garden of Eden. When the 
when Satan has successfully attacked the supremacy of God's word, all these other doctrines that I'm going to share with you are easy targets for him. He attacks the sufficiency of God's son. He also attacks the singularity of God's gospel. Today we're living in a pluralistic society where people don't want to believe there's only one gospel, only one way to heaven. He's also attacking the sovereignty of God's grace. He does that in the Roman Catholic religion through the efficacious waters of infant baptism. Catholics believe that is a sacrament of regeneration. He also attacks the security of God's children, the severity of God's punishment. He does that through this place called purgatory that Catholics believe they will have to suffer for a while for their sins. And lastly, he's attacking the sanctity of God's church. Well, his attack on God's word is multifaceted. He and his legions of liars suppress the word of God and unrighteousness. The word of God is nullified by traditions, invalidated by false teachers, opposed by religious pride, snatched away when it is sown, added to, distorted, and perverted. And as we look at Rome's drift into apostasy in the next hour, we're going to see how they have successfully supplanted all of these doctrines that you see on your screen. We're also going to look at several other key doctrines that they have nullified. The New Testament also warns us that many fiery darts will be fired on the Lord's church. As we look throughout the New Testament, we see these fiery darts will be in the form of worldly fables, speculations, empty philosophy, false knowledge, doctrines of demons, myths, lying spirits, vain deceits, heresies, traditions of men, and yes, Satan is very successful at planting his terrors within the church. The Apostle Paul warned of those who had strayed concerning the truth, and we're going to look at that in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 17 and 18. He said that they strayed concerning the truth and had overthrown the faith of some. When you look at the 2,000-year history of the church, I think we can see two streams of Christianity operating side by side. You have the apostolic church. It is made up of born-again Christians who are hated and persecuted by the world. The Lord Jesus promised the gates of hell shall not prevail against it in Matthew 16, 18. The other stream of Christianity is the apostate church. It departed from the faith to follow doctrines of demons. Spiritually dead people left the apostolic church because they were never part of it, as we see in 1 John chapter 2, verse 19. So apostasy in the church spreads like gangrene, as Paul said, or like cancer. And we know how destructive cancer can be on the physical body. It has a similar effect on the body of Christ. If churches allow doctrinal air to continue to flow throughout the body, the body becomes weaker and weaker. So apostasy is not only a departure from the faith of the apostles, but also a departure from the church, from the Lord Jesus Christ, and from the gospel of grace. And we see that in 1 John chapter 2, a departure from the church. John writes, many antichrists have arisen. From this we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not really of us. For if they had been of us, they would have remained with us. But they went out in order that it might be shown that they are all not of us. In other words, they went out from us because they were never born of the Spirit. If they had been born again, they would have remained with us. We also see departing from Jesus in Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 to 7. The Apostle Paul writes, I am amazed that you are so quickly deserting him, the Lord Jesus Christ, who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel, which is really not another. Only there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. 
we see here in this passage that the goal of deception is to lure the sheep away from the protecting arm of the good shepherd. And this is so the church can eventually be destroyed. The Judaizers had convinced Gentile Christians that Jesus was not sufficient to save them. They said they must also obey the law. And because of this deception, they were deserting him and the gospel of grace. Paul warned them that Jesus plus anything is a false and fatal gospel, and those who teach such heresy are to be condemned. The word anathema is only used twice in the New Testament, once here and once for those who do not love God. Clearly, when another Jesus is preached, it always leads to another gospel. We also see departing from the faith in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. Paul writes, the Spirit expressly says that in later times some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons through the insincerity of liars whose consciousness are seared. It's interesting to note that one of the doctrines of demons that Paul goes on to describe is forbidding people to marry. This reminds me of a couple of Catholic nuns that visited our church in North Dallas several years ago. I asked them what brought them there. They were easily identifiable. They were wearing their habits. They said that they were taking a course in junior college on world religions, and their assignment was to go out and study different churches. And so I began answering their questions as they asked what we did through the service. And when they were satisfied with all the answers that I provided, I said, before you leave, can I ask you a question? Is it true that you are forbidden to marry? Oh, yes, we have taken a vow of celibacy. I said, did you happen to know that that is a doctrine of the devil? And I opened my Bible and I shared with them this verse. They said, wow, we've never seen that. We're going to have to talk to our priest about this. Well, as they were asking many questions, they noticed that I was quickly turning in the Bible to answer them. And they said, how is it that you know where all these answers are in your Bible? I said, I was once a Catholic just like you, and I didn't know the Bible, and I was easily deceived. Well, now they were ready to leave. But I did give them one of our gospel tracts, and I encouraged them to spend time in God's Word to know the truth. We also see a departing from the truth. Apostates are men who turn away from the truth. They profess to know God, but by their deeds they deny Him, being detestable and disobedient and worthless for any good deed. As you can see here, as Tommy has already said, the departure from the faith is seen both in doctrine and in conduct. When you look at the history of the church, you could describe the first 600 years as the ancient church, and that was when Scripture was proclaimed. And then you had the medieval church, the next 900 years where Scripture was hidden from the people. This med- medieval church continued on in apostasy, But praise God, he raised up the Reformers for the Reformation Church in the 1500s. And that is when Scripture was restored. Now we're in the modern or even the postmodern church where Scripture is being ignored. The medieval church was dominated by Roman Catholicism, and we will see that in more detail in a moment. But I want to share with you that apostolic and apostate churches share some of the fundamentals of the Christian faith. You see two circles on the screen here, and they overlap. One circle contains the Word of God, and the other, the traditions of men. The apostolic church submits to the authority of Scripture. But the apostate church nullify and deny the gospel of Jesus Christ and the Word of God as they start shifting toward religious traditions, the traditions and opinions of men denying the supreme authority of God's Word. So this overlap of common truth is what convinces many evangelicals that Roman Catholicism is a valid expression of Christianity. However, the drift into apostasy 
as you will see, occurs when the word of God is gradually replaced by the traditions, opinions, and philosophies of men. As I looked at church history and studied how churches and denominations depart from the faith, I recognize that there are at least four significant steps that they take. The first step into apostasy is when God's word is replaced as the supreme authority for faith and practice. We also see worldly traditions creep in that cause confusion and divided loyalties. Biblical evangelism is replaced by sacramental salvation or other unbiblical methods of conver- excuse me, conversion. The purity of the gospel is weakened by compromise and distortion such that it loses its power to save anyone. People are given what they want instead of what they need. The Lord Jesus said, Every, everyone who hears his word and does not do it will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. I think we can see that any church that does not exhort its congregation to be doers of God's word is a house built on shifting sand which will erode as the rains of apostasy come down on the church. We can learn a lot from church history. The second step into apostasy occurs when scripture is twisted and distorted for self-serving agendas. When biblical ignorance provides fertile soil for false teachers and doctrinal error. You see, in many churches today, we're seeing the word of God is not being taught from the pulpit. This gives fertile ground for deception to creep into the church. We see Satan sowing his terrors with little or no resistance. Infallible men arise claiming to be successors of the apostles. God is honored with lips, but hearts are far from him. And legalism controls people. Contenders for the faith are asked to leave. They are dismissed from the church. When people do not have access to the word of God or they're not hearing it from the pulpit, they are easy prey for false teachers. The third step into apostasy is when religious pride blinds people from the light of the gospel. I'm convinced from 2 Corinthians 4.4 4, when we read that Satan has blinded the minds of unbelievers so they cannot see the light of the gospel or the glory of Christ. I'm convinced that the number one most effective tool he uses to blind people is religious pride. For 20 years, I have been witnessing to people who have religious pride. They're blinded from the truth. They have no interest. And this third step into apostasy, we see a form of godliness, but it's void of the gospel's power. Hearts are hardened. Worshiping God in truth is replaced by worshiping false Christ, worshiping icons and saints. Love for God has grown cold. Biblical warnings to expose false teachers are ignored. Doctrinal error is embraced and discernment is dying. Sin and immoral lifestyles are now tolerated in this third step. And then the fourth step into apostasy is when doctrines of demons are taught and deception is full-blown. Jesus is outside the church and Bible believers are condemned with anathema. Lying signs and wonders are called messages from God. Idolatry and prayers to the dead are encouraged Grace is turned into a license to sin, and the church's lampstand has been removed, and a certain terrifying judgment is now unavoidable. There's no point of return for these victims of deception as they teeter on the edge of a bottomless pit. Looking at Rome's history of departing from the faith, I want to quickly go through this chronological Um, progression into apostasy, and we'll look in a little bit more detail at each one of these. In 431, there was the proclamation that water baptism is what regenerates the soul. 500 AD was the sacrifice of the mass, indulgences as a remission for temporal punishment for sin, 
1190. Transubstantiation became a dogma in 1215. Purgatory was pronounced as an infallible dogma in 1438. Tradition was declared equal to the Bible at the Counter-Reformation at the Council of Trent. The Immaculate Conception of Mary was proclaimed as an infallible dogma in 1854. Papal infallibility was proclaimed at Vatican Council I. And then in 1950, Mary was proclaimed to have been assumed into heaven. This is the history of Roman Catholicism. Well, how did this all begin? What was the development of the Roman Catholic religion? In the second century, churches abandoned the plurality of elders in favor of a, of, excuse me, of a ruling bishop. Tim, that's the second thing that happens when you get older. You lose your memory, and then you lose your ability to pronounce words. Ignatius taught that, that churches without a bishop had no authority to do baptisms or the Lord's Supper. This major change paved the way for doctrinal error to enter the church with less resistance. It's much easier for the father of lies to deceive one ruling bishop where there is no accountability or correction from an elder board. Satan's strategy to destroy the church has always been to place falsehoods in the minds of ecclesiastical leaders. In God's providence and under his divine protection, some churches remained with a plurality of elders and refused to appoint a ruling bishop. They believed the proof of the Spirit's leading was not found in an office, but in the lives of believers. My brothers and sisters in Christ, this is so important as we see the development of the Roman Catholic religion. The church, the true church of Jesus Christ, can only fulfill her divinely ordained mission to the extent that she functions according to the master's blueprint. When they discard that and start following other blueprints, this is when the seeds of apostasy come in. I want to share with you some of the second and third century fathers. Clement headed the school of Alexandria from 190 to 202. He blended Greek philosophy with Christianity, and he evolved the idea of purgatory. Tertullian in 155 taught the authority of the church over scripture and apostolic succession. He taught celibacy for clergy, baptism for the forgiveness of sin. Origen, in 18, I'm sorry, 185 to 254, taught the allegorical method of interpretation. He also taught baptismal regeneration and salvation by works and Mariology. Origen lived in Alexandria, Egypt, which was the focal point of Isis worship. So this idolatry was absorbed into Christianity as bishops replaced the worship of Isip with the worship of Mary. Mariology entered the church. Roman Catholicism refers to all of these men as their early church fathers and say their teachings originated from the oral traditions of the apostles. Clearly, these teachings are not found in the written word of God. False teaching enters the church through teachers who have little or no accountability. Paul warned the church of deceptive men such as these. In Acts chapter 20, he wrote, Be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock. I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from your own selves, men will arise to distort the truth for the purpose of leading people astray. Paul is addressing the elder board. From your own number, he says, men will arise distorting the church, distorting the truth. Ambrose, 339 to 397, was the bishop of Milan. He believed the Lord's Supper was a sacrifice. He offered prayers for the dead. Jerome, who translated the Bible into Latin, believed Mary was co-redeemer. 
He believed in holy water, venerating bones of dead saints, and praying to saints. Augustine, in 354, taught baptism and the Lord's Supper were the means of salvation. The church is the only valid interpreter of Scripture. He taught Mary was sinless in purgatory and celibacy. In the 4th century, Christian worship was transformed into a sacrifice and the teaching ministry was converted into a sacrificing priesthood. The church's fathers are actually the fathers of the Roman Catholic Church. And this is the main reason why many Protestants are departing from their churches to join the Roman Catholic religion. When they depart, it has nothing to do with doctrine. They point to the early church fathers who were practicing these things, and they said this proves that the Roman Catholic religion was the true church of the first 300 years. Several years ago, within a matter of months, I got two letters, two emails from Dallas Theological Seminary students. Their letters were very similar. I want to share with you one of them. I actually attempted to set the truth straight with each one of them, but failed. This one writes, Dear Mike, I enrolled at DTS to find some answers and to prove the Catholic Church wrong. After a semester of talking to professors, not a single one could give me an answer to the issue of authority. What good is an infallible book without an infallible living authority to interpret it? I finally went to what the Catholic Church has taught consistently for 2,000 years and realized that the James Whites R.C. Sproul's and Mike Gendron's were spreading utter lies about Catholicism. So now I have decided to join the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church wins every argument by their claim to a historical, provable, transmitted authority given them from the apostles. Christ left us with an authority structure in the Catholic Church as the only way to stay true to his word. This is what we're up against. We need to know church history. We need to know that the seeds of apostasy were planted in the 2nd and 3rd century. In the 4th century, paganism entered the church. The Roman emperor Constantine attributed his victory in a major battle to the Christian God, and he made Christianity the state religion. Pagans, with their heathen customs, entered the church through the ritual of water baptism with no repentance required. Pagan ceremonies and superstitions were blended into the liturgy. Pagan temples became places of Christian worship, and pagan festivals were refashioned into Christian celebrations. Constantine decided he should rule the church, and he began calling for councils of all the ruling bishops. The union of church and state corrupted apostolic teaching with pagan traditions. Many came into the church politically motivated, but religiously disinterested. The best positions in the state were given to pagan Christians. Tragically, the church gained the whole world, but lost its soul. The church should have learned from a similar offer that was made to Jesus by Satan. When Satan offered the world to Christ, he rejected it, choosing instead to fulfill his mission. When Constantine offered the world to the church, she foolishly accepted the offer rather than remain sanctified and fulfill her mission. In the first 300 years of church history, the fires of persecution had kept the church pure, but toleration with the world had now corrupted it. From the 4th through the 6th century, there were five provinces in Alexandria, Jerusalem, Antioch, Rome, and Constantinople, each with a ruling bishop overseeing churches. In 440, the bishop of Rome, Leo I, claimed judicial authority over all other bishops and became the first pope. Claims were made that Peter had lived and labored as bishops of Rome for 20 years, but the New Testament knows nothing of this. 
This did not matter to Leo, and he, appoint, he uh, actually pointed toward Matthew 16, 18. He said the bishop of Rome should become the head of all the churches because the bishops of Rome were successors of Peter. When the Roman Empire collapsed, the pope took the title Pontificus Maximus, which had previously belonged to the Roman emperors. The fall of the Roman Empire led to the rise of the Roman Church as power was transformed from one institution to the other. Bishops now ruled in provinces where pagan governors had once ruled. At the time, some bishops sought to increase their authority and prestige by accusing others of false doctrine and asking the state to support their position. Can you see how these ruling bishops got together in these provinces and eventually pointed to the Bishop of Rome as the first pope? As apostolic Christianity remained sanctified by the truth of God's word, disputes over doctrine were settled by ecumenical councils. The Council of Ephesus established devotion to Mary as mother of God, which is an impossibility since God is eternal. This led to other falsehoods, including her eternal virginity and her sinlessness. In 590, Pope Gregory filled the power vacuum as the empire imploded. It was Gregory I who organized a papal government to rule a decaying society. He enforced celibacy for the clergy, expanded the concept of purgatory, and converted the Eucharist from a sacrament into a redemptive sacrifice with merit not only for the living but also for the dead. He approved the invocation of saints and martyrs and the use of relics and amulets to reduce temporal punishment for sin. In the seventh century, popes claimed to be vicars of Christ. Bishops began wearing costly garments and encouraged veneration of icons. A sacrificing priesthood with mysterious powers was instituted, and Mary, along with priests, were declared mediators of divine grace. If you trace the flow of grace in the Roman Catholic religion, they say it originates from God the Father. It flows through the wounds of Christ into the hands of Mary, then it is dispensed through the Roman Catholic priesthood as he offers sacraments to those Catholics coming forward. This is the flow of divine grace. Nothing is more condemned in Scripture than idolatry. Making and venerating graven images is forbidden, but most people were deceived out of ignorance. They didn't know the second commandment in Exodus 20, verses 4 and 5. And that's because from the 6th century through the 16th century, the Bible was a closed book to the common people. The Roman Catholic Church had become a kingdom of darkness, promoting ignorance and superstition and holding people in legalistic bondage. People were absorbed with their own experiences that they never came to a knowledge of the truth. They sought visions they carried wooden crosses, marched and killed in holy water, in holy wars. They went on pilgrimages to holy places and indulged in superstitious practices. They thought they were meriting God's favor. Did you know in Roman Catholicism today they are taught that they must merit the grace of God for their salvation? Well, the growing apostasy was not universal. The true shepherd of the church never left his gospel without witnesses. As apostates departed from the faith, God raised up others to proclaim his glorious gospel of grace. And may God be glorified for his faithfulness to his church. The Lord promised the gates of hell would not prevail against it. He has always had a remnant of Bible-believing, born-again Christians who opposed heretical teachings. Many of them proved the reality of true saving faith when they were persecuted by the Roman Catholic Church. From 867 to 1049, the Roman Church became infested with corrupt, immoral popes. Such 
popes were assassinated by their successors. Some had mistresses whose illegitimate sons became popes. One actually worshipped pagan gods and turned the papal palace into a house of prostitution. Another pope sold his papacy for money. Listen to this sequence of events. In 904, Pope Christopher was murdered by Pope Sergius III. Sergius III then had an illegitimate son who became John XI. In 955, Pope John II died in the act of adultery. Finally, in 1059, the Roman people lost their right to elect the pope, and a college of cardinals was established to elect future popes. I can't help but be reminded of Titus chapter 1, verses 14 to 16, how apostates profess to know God, but by their deeds they deny him, being detestable and disobedient and worthless for any good deed. Any church leader who claims to be a spokesman for God, but has a life characterized by corruption, immorality, and greed, has proved himself to be a fraud. And then you had holy wars and schisms in the 11th century. A series of military campaigns began when Pope Urban II called for crusades to resist Muslim advances. And then the ongoing conflict between the Western Catholic Church and the Eastern Orthodox Church ended up with the Great Schism in 1054. The two main reasons for this division were the refusal of the Orthodox Church to submit to the authority of an infallible pope, and also their refusal, their refusal to command priests to be celibate. Several hundred years later, in 1215, the Fourth Lateran Council declared transubstantiation to be an infallible dogma. This is where the priest is said to have the power to call the Lord Jesus Christ back down from heaven and transubstantiate the inner substance of a wafer into his physical body and blood, soul and divinity, such that this becomes the physical Christ returning to the earth. In 1300, Pope Boniface VIII proclaimed the first jubilee year and offered a plenary indulgence to thousands of pilgrims who came to Rome. A plenary indulgence simply means that if you came to Rome during that time, all of your sins were forgiven. In the 13th century, Innocent III ordered inquisitions to prosecute Bible believers. In one inquisition, two million Albigenses were killed, and a total of over 50 million Christians were slaughtered by Rome. The Church of Rome had drifted into full-fledged apostasy, not only tolerating sin and immorality, but practicing idolatry and putting to death anyone who contended earnestly for the faith. W.C. Brownlee, in letters in the Roman Catholic controversy, said, and I quote, Thus the Church of Rome stands before the world, the woman in scarlet, on the scarlet-colored beast, a church claiming to be Christian, is drenched in the blood of of 68,500,000 human beings. This is the church that evangelicals are signing unity accords with today. It hasn't changed. It still upholds infallible dogmas that we are looking at. In the 13th century, Thomas Aquinas claimed merit could be transferred through the purchase of indulgences. During the Middle Ages, groups such as the Waldenses arose that rejected the Roman Church's dogmas and believed the Bible was their final authority. In 1229, the Roman Synod of Toulouse forbid lay people to have the Bible. Apparently, Rome did not want the truth of God's word setting anyone else free. And that's what we read in John chapter 8, verses 31 to 32. Those who were abiding in God's word knew the truth, and the truth was setting them free from religious deception. The Roman church excommunicated the Waldenses for preaching without the approval of a bishop. 
I love to go out witnessing to Roman Catholic priests as I travel throughout the world. Not too long ago, I knocked on the rectory door and a priest came out and I engaged him with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And each time I shared a verse, he came back with a Roman Catholic tradition. This went on for 15 minutes and finally the priest said, you know what your problem is, Mike? You take the word of God too seriously. Roman Catholic Church does not like the Word of God. It upholds several fundamentals of the Christian faith, but there is a veneer of truth that hides a false and fatal gospel. Then you had conflicts between the church and state that was marked in the 14th century. This caused Clement V to become the first pope to reside in Avignon, France. When the papacy returned to Rome in 1377, it created what is known as the Great Papal Schism. For the next 38 years, two rival popes claimed the papal throne in Rome in Avignon. Efforts at resolution failed, and so a third pope was elected in 1409 to share the throne. The matter was finally resolved in 1417 when all three resigned in a new election named Martin V, the Pope. The next year, the papacy had John Huss burned at the stake for preaching God's word. Rome called it heresy. In 1516, Pope Leo needed cash to finish St. Peter's Basilica, so he raised money by selling indulgences for God's forgiveness Ironically, the cathedral built to worship God was paid for with the wages of iniquity. It was Johann Tetzel who was appointed by the Pope to sell indulgences in Germany. He proclaimed that indulgences were the most precious gift of God. He issued certificates for the pardon of sins, and he said they had the power to save both the living and the dead. He assured people that the very moment the money was paid, the soul in purgatory would escape. Heresy and corruption was well known throughout the Roman Catholic religion. In God's providence, Martin Luther was sent to Rome, and he was shocked at the immoral corruption of the clergy. While there, he climbed these, chair, these stairs that you see on the screen. He believed that each step would take away one year in purgatory. And then God's word spoke to him. I'm sure he remembered what God had said in Romans 1.17, the just shall live by faith. Luther sprang to his feet and ran off in shame and in horror. He saw more clearly than ever before the fallacy of trusting human works for salvation. His eyes had been opened, never again to be deceived by the delusions of the papacy. The Castle Church of Wittenberg had over 1,900 relics of dead saints on display. Catholics were granted indulgences for the remission of sins if they viewed the relics and made confession. This gross superstition involving the use of relics originated in paganism. And this idolatrous practice is just one of many traditions that reveal the great deception within the Roman Catholic religion. On October 31st, 1517, on the eve of All Saints Day, when Catholics would be venerating their relics, Luther posted 95 theses against indulgences on the door of the castle church. This was the spark that ignited the Reformation. Luther exposed indulgences as a wicked method to extort money and a device of Satan to destroy the souls of those being deceived. Listen to this. Just as a side note, years later, the Council of Trent commanded the veneration of dead bodies and condemned those who did not believe in relics. Since it was believed that many benefits could come through the bones of dead men, the sale of bodies and bones became big business for the Church of Rome. Well, Luther made his bold stand in 1518 after questioning the primacy of the Roman Church 
in its power of excommunication, Luther was called a heretic. Pope Leo X warned Luther in a papal bull that he will be excommunicated unless he recants. Luther responded, and I quote, Pope Leo's papal bull condemns Christ himself, and he is certain the Pope is the Antichrist. Luther said, a serious struggle has just begun. Up until now, I've only been playing with the Pope. I began this work in God's name, and it will be ended without me and by his might. Luther had much to say about the papacy. He said the Pope is the very Antichrist who has exalted himself above and opposed himself against Christ because he will not permit Christians to be saved without his power, to lie, to kill, and to destroy body and soul eternally. That is where his papal government really consists. Through the proclamation of God's word by Luther and other reformers, the, tr the truth of God's word was setting many captives free from religious bondage and deception. And so it was that the Vatican attempted to reverse the Reformation. Luther responded in 1541, Popish writers pretend that they have always taught what we now teach concerning faith and good works, and that they are unjustly c accused of the contrary. Thus the wolf puts on the sheepskin till he gains admission into the fold. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, this attempt by Rome to reverse the Reformation is but a precursor to the unity accords that are seducing many evangelicals today. I'm sure all of you are familiar with them. They started in 1994 with evangelicals and Catholics together. More recently, we had the Manhattan Declaration in 2009. Now over 600,000 evangelicals have signed in accord with Catholics and Orthodox. I hope nobody in this room signed that. Rome's historic apostasy is now drawing other professing Christians into its web through, ecu through the ecumenical movement. I hope you see Rome's strategy here. They want highly visible evangelicals to proclaim the Roman Catholic religion as a valid expression of Christianity. It's no different from what they did in 1541. They can no longer put to death those who are opposed to the Roman Catholic religion. Now they're trying to seduce us, and they're doing a very effective job. We need to be students of church history. Those who will not learn from history are doomed to repeat it. Well, Rome's apostasy was officially complete at the Council of Trent. It deliberately and dogmatically departed from the gospel of Jesus Christ at this council in 1545. Her apostasy is documented by over 100 infallible anathemas that condemn Bible believers who trust Christ as he is revealed in scripture. The council also elevated religious tradition to be equal in authority to the word of God. The bishops placed the Bible on the list of forbidden books. They would not forgive the sins of anyone who had a Bible in their possession until they returned it to the Roman Catholic Church. 24 years later, after Trent, a papal bull established devotion to the rosary, which guides Catholics through 53 repetitious prayers to Mary. According to scripture, anyone that prays to anyone other than the triune God is committing the sin of blasphemy. Well, Roman Catholicism's apostasy has resulted in major departures from the doctrines of the Christian faith and we all need to know this so that we can know how to earnestly contend for the faith. There's much at stake if we don't contend earnestly for the faith. Number one, the glory and honor and praise of our Lord Jesus Christ is at stake. The sanctity of his church, the purity of his gospel, and ultimately the eternal destinies of those who are being deceived. Rome's rejection of scriptural authority is documented well in the Catechism of the Catholic Church. Paragraph 95, 
states that Rome rejects the supreme authority of Scripture by elevating its tradition and bishops to be equal in authority to God's Word. I don't have to remind you of 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, where Scripture is used for rebuking and correcting anyone that's in error, whether it be bishops or traditions. We see in paragraph 97, Rome corrupts God's Word by adding traditions to it. We're familiar with Proverbs 30, verses 5 and 6. Do not add to his words, lest he rebuke you, and you be found a liar. Rome dares to say that its traditions are the word of God. Rome also declares its bishops alone have been entrusted with giving an authentic interpretation of the word of God. Paragraph 85 But what do we read in 1 John 2.26? You have no need for anyone to teach you, but as his anointing teaches you about all things and is true and is not a lie, and just as it has taught you, you abide in him. We don't need to go to the bishops of the Catholic Church. Peter wrote in 2 Peter 2, verse 1, False prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who brought them, bringing swift destruction upon themselves. Has the Roman Catholic religion denied the master? Paragraph I'll get into the paragraph numbers in a moment. Rome denies that he is the only sinless mediator, and the only head of the church. You know, if you know Roman Catholicism, that they have another sinless mediator, and her name is Mary. Rome also denies the Lord's atonement is sufficient for eternal justification. We see in Hebrews 10.14, By one offering he has made perfect forever those who are being sanctified. Rome denies his work of redemption is finished to the point where they continue the work of redemption on Catholic altars every day of every week. Rome also denies the Lord's blood as the only purification for sin. Roman Catholicism denies the finished work of our Lord Jesus Christ. If you've ever been into a Roman Catholic church, you know that Jesus is depicted in one of three ways. He's either a dead man still hanging on a cross, a helpless babe in the arms of his mother, or a lifeless, inanimate piece of bread called the Eucharist. In all three of these depictions, the Roman Catholic Jesus is helpless to do anything for Roman Catholics. What a contrast. You and I worship a risen ascended Savior who sits at the right hand of God as our defense attorney. What a contrast. We must proclaim Jesus as he's revealed in Scripture. The Roman Catholic sacrifice of the Mass, according to paragraph 1367, the sacrifice of Christ and the sacrifice of the Eucharist are one single sacrifice. The Council of Trent dared to say this. If anyone says the sacrifice of the Mass is not a propitiatory sacrifice or that it ought not to be offered for the living and the dead for sins, pains, and satisfactions, let him be anathema. This is just one of over a hundred anathemas that condemn you and I. How can evangelicals sign unity accords with a religion that condemns them over 100 times? Well, this sacrifice of the Mass is a multisensory ritual which appeals to the flesh. We see Rome's illegitimate priesthood encourages the idolatrous worship of a wafer as the physical presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let The the Lord Jesus Christ said, If anyone says to you, Here is the Christ, do not believe them. And yes, this is exactly what every Roman Catholic priest and bishop does during the sacrifice of the Mass. And Catholics are told to worship this as their 
living Christ. God's word makes it clear that Jesus, Jesus is not physically present in the Eucharist. Can we point Catholics to one scripture that proves this is a false Christ? There are several, but Hebrews 9.28 says it best. He shall appear a second time for salvation without reference to sin. Remember, this is a propitiatory sacrifice according to Rome. If you don't believe it, you're condemned. So which is the true Jesus? Catholics teach Jesus is received physically, frequently in the stomach. The body, blood, soul, and divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ is truly, really, and substantially contained in the Eucharist. Paragraph 1374. You and I received Jesus once, spiritually, in the heart. In Ephesians 3.17, we read, Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. Paul wrote, if someone proclaims another Jesus than the one we proclaimed, or if you receive a different spirit from the one you received, or if you accept a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it readily enough. In other words, Paul is saying, you are not contending for the faith against false Christ and false gospels. You put up with it. You allow victims of deception to march proudly toward hell's gates without intervening. Why are we putting up with it? Another Christ always leads to another gospel. This is a quote that just really grieves me. 18th century Bishop St. Alfonso de la Cori said, The priest is called the creator of his creator. He creates Jesus in the sacrament. In creating the world, it was sufficient for God to say, Let it be made. So it is sufficient for the priest to speak. And behold, the bread is the body of Jesus Christ. The priest has the power of delivering sinners from hell, and God himself is obliged to abide by the judgment of his priest. This bishop who blasphemed God was canonized in 1839 and proclaimed a doctor of the church. This quote is taken from his book, The Dignity and Duties of the Priest. False teachers consistently reject the divine authority of God's word for blasphemous religious traditions. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, I'm being very hard on the Roman Catholic religion. I love Roman Catholic people. They are victims of deception of this false religion. We are to love the individual Catholics, but hate the institution that deceives them. I hope you all see that. The Roman Catholic Church says there is an ongoing offering of Jesus. Catholics teach Jesus is offered daily on its altars for sins of the living and the dead. Jesus was offered once, according to Hebrews 10, verses 12 and 18. He was offered once for all time. Having offered one sacrifice for sins for all time, he sat down at the right hand of God. There is no longer any offering for sin. Well, the Roman Catholic religion has indeed perverted the gospel of Jesus Christ. We know the gospel that saves us is by grace through faith in the Lord Jesus. Paul said those who believe anything else believe in vain. What does a Roman Catholic have to do in order to be saved? Well, they must have faith plus the sacraments, plus participate in the sacrifice of the Mass, plus spend time in purgatory, plus receive indulgences, be baptized as the sacrament of justification. They must keep the law, which, as you know, places them under a curse, according to Galatians 3, and they must do good works. Rome's Jesus is not sufficient to save sinners completely. It's no wonder the Apostle Paul drove a stake in the ground in Galatians chapter 1 when the Judaizers wanted to add one requirement for salvation. If the Judaizers were under the condemnation of God's word, look how many times 
the Catholic Church has added to the gospel of grace. They are under the same curse. We must lead a rescue mission into the Catholic religion, rescue the victims of deception from this church that is condemned by the word of God. The Catholic religion also perverts God's grace. Rome declares grace is initiated by water baptism, lost by mortal sin, merited by good works, obtained through indulgences, distributed through Mary, who is the mediatrix of all grace, received through the sacraments, and withheld from those who are excommunicated. God's word warns those who pervert his grace in Jude 4, for certain men have crept in unnoticed who long ago were designated for this condemnation, ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only Master and Lord. We know the core of the gospel is justification by faith. Rome opposes that in many different ways. Roman Catholicism says justification is by grace plus merit. Justification is God's work in us. God's word says it is by grace alone. It is God's work for us. Rome says it's a process whereby righteousness is infused through the sacraments. God's word says it is instantaneous. When the gavel comes down in the court of God's law, righteousness is instantaneously imputed. Rome says the duration of justification is temporal, lost by sin. God's word says the duration of justification is eternal. It is never undone by sin. Rome said God justifies those who are good. Romans 4, 5 tells us otherwise. God justifies the ungodly. Listen to Canon 9 of the Council of Trent. If anyone says that by faith alone the impious is justified, such that nothing else is required to cooperate in order to obtain the grace of justification, let him be anathema. I believe everyone in this room is condemned by the Roman Catholic religion. When you get justification wrong, you get the gospel wrong. The reformers said justification is the very hinge upon which the gates of heaven open and close. Apostates also follow doctrines of demons. Rome adopted Satan's first lie and that it says you surely shall not die with its doctrine of venial sins. You see, Rome categorizes sins into two separate distinctions. You have venial sin, which is lesser. Mortal sin, such as murder, adultery, or missing church on Sunday, condemns you to hell. But Rome says venial sins don't cause death. Speaking through deluded ministers of righteousness, Rome declares that lesser sins do not cause death, only temporal punishment. What does the Bible say? The wages of sin is death. The soul that sins will surely die. At the Council of Florence in 1438, the infallible dogma of purgatory was established. And they said if they have died repentant but have not made satisfaction for sins, then their souls after death are cleansed by the punishment of purgatory. Also, the suffrages of the faithful still living are efficacious in bringing them relief from such punishment, namely the sacrifice of the Mass, prayers, and almsgiving. Do you want one verse that destroys this fallacious dogma of purgatory? 1 John 1, 7. The blood of Jesus Christ purif purifies us of all sin. Trust in him, and then you'll depart from the doctrine of purgatory. Rome rejects God's promise of eternal life by teaching those justified may end up in hell. But what does God's word say? Those whom he justified, he also glorified. Rome replaces the sovereign regenerating work of the Spirit with baptismal regeneration. What does the word of God say? 
children of God are born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Rome's bishops claim to be successors of the apostles. The Bible says successors had to be witnesses of the resurrection. Remember in Acts chapter 1, verse 22, when Judas committed suicide, the apostles got together and established the criteria. I can tell you that Rome's bishops are false apostles, deceitful workmen, masquerading as apostles of Christ because they were not eyewitnesses to the life and death of the Lord Jesus Christ. We see that the papacy is the head of an apostate church. It steals titles from the triune God. Aren't you just so upset when you hear evangelicals calling the Pope Holy Father or head of the church or the vicar of Christ? These were titles given to the triune God, which the Pope wears today. The Pope receives worship due only to God as we see this priest bowing down to Pope Benedict. The papacy usurps God's infallibility. It also condemns all who believe God's gospel. We've seen that. It also robs Christ of his power over souls. I've got to share with you what paragraph 937 says about the Pope. He has supreme, full, immediate, and universal power in the care of souls. He is said to exercise this power unhindered. The Pope is responsible for over a billion souls who trust him as an infallible source for truth. Clearly, the most wicked thing anyone could do would be to lead people away from heaven to the fires of hell. Any Pope who flouts his own authority, boasts of his own holiness, steals titles given to God alone, defies imagination. Yet so many are deluded by this papacy. Two months ago, Dr. Timothy George, the Dean of Beeson Divinity School, representing the Baptist World Alliance at the Synod of Bishops in Rome, began his address to the Pope and bishops with this greeting. Dear Holy Father, venerable fathers of the Synod, brothers and sisters in the Lord. Evangelicals today don't know whether or not the Roman Catholic religion is a mission field or are they brothers and sisters in Christ and together we should go out and evangelize the world. It's because of statements such as this by evangelical leaders. In 1870, the First Vatican Council pronounced papal infallibility. I think we all know what infallibility means. The Pope cannot err in matters of faith and morals. And then you have Mary quite contrary. Roman Catholic's Mary is quite different from the biblical Mary. Rome's Mary is said to have been conceived immaculately. This became a dogma in 1854. It declared that she was conceived without original sin. This, of course, must have meant that her father was without sin and his father was without sin because we know the sin of Adam is passed down through the seed of man. We also see in 1950, Mary's body was assumed into heaven. This became a dogma. Catholics are obligated to attend Mass on December 8th celebrating Mary's Immaculate Conception. If they do not attend, they commit a mortal sin. Let me share with you an apostate's prayer, how differently apostates pray than apostolic churches pray. Come to my help, dearest mother and advocate. In thy hands I place my eternal salvation. And to thee do I entrust my soul. Take me under thy protection, and it is enough for me. For if thou protect me, I fear nothing, not from my sins, because thou wilt obtain for me the pardon of them, nor from the devils, because thou art more powerful than all hell together. 
nor even from Jesus, my judge himself, because by one prayer from thee, he will be appeased. There's quite a difference between born-again Christians and apostates. Born-again Christians are possessors of Christ, made alive by the Spirit. Apostates are merely professors of Christ who are spiritually dead. Born-again Christians earnestly contend for the God-given faith of the apostles. Apostates deliberately depart from the faith of the apostles. Born-again Christians exalt Jesus as the only master, the only Lord and head of the church. Apostates deny Jesus as the all-sufficient Savior and the only Lord and head of the church. Born-again Christians know God and do the works prepared by him. Apostates claim to know God but deny him by their deeds. Born-again Christians are devoted to apostolic teaching and sound doctrine. Apostates exchange sound doctrine and truth for myths. Born-again Christians are saved by grace because of what God has done in Christ. Apostates believe salvation is based on what man must do for God. In these days of growing deception, the line between born-again believers and apostates has become blurred. What was once a black and white issue at the time of the Reformation has now become gray within evangelical circles. It's my prayer that we can all learn from church history and contend not passively, but earnestly for the faith of the apostles. So what must we do as we leave this conference? I think, number one, we need not be surprised by the growing deception in the church. Did you know that the Bible said God allows it for the testing of our faith? Where is your loyalty? Is it to Christ and his word? or the teachings and traditions of men. We need to abide in the word faithfully and study it systematically to learn the whole counsel of God. Ignorance of scripture leaves Christians prone to deception. We need to grow in the knowledge of Christ to be able to contend earnestly for the faith. And we need to love the truth with such a passion that we will despise the air that opposes God's word. We must be obedient to God's word and keep away from every brother who does not live according to apostolic teaching. We must expose false teachers and their evil deeds of darkness. What's at stake if we don't earnestly contend for the faith of the apostles, the glory and honor and name of our Lord Jesus Christ, the sanctity of his church? We must keep the tares out also the purity of the gospel because without the purity of the gospel the eternal destiny of those who are being deceived hangs in the balance well there are many examples that i could share with you of those who do not contend earnestly for the faith but there's one that really grieves me that i don't want, i want to share with you there's a pastor here in the Dallas area, that shortly after Pope John Paul II died, he published an article in his church magazine called The Chatter. And in this magazine, he had a picture of John Paul II and Mother Teresa. And in the article, he said these words, the rift that occurred between Catholics and Protestants 500 years ago is theological pettiness. In other words, this pastor is saying that the reformers who were brutally beaten and burned at the stake died for theological pettiness. He said, we'll have plenty of time in heaven to figure out who was right about purgatory and Mary. John Paul was a man of God whom all Christians should admire, thank, and emulate. What impact do you believe this had on the church that read these words? Did it place the Roman Catholic religion off limits? Did they have any desire to reach out to Roman Catholics after they read this? 
Well, there is a vivid contrast between the apostles who were strong and bold and fearless. They were dogmatic, intolerant, inflexible with the truth, unaccommodating of sin and error. Today, we're living in the era of new evangelicalism. It's often identified by Christians who are cautious, intolerant, pragmatic, flexible, accommodating, passive, non-controversial, politically correct, non-offensive, non-dogmatic, all with their self-serving agendas. Apostates are on a different path to eternity. We need to be aware of this. The Lord Jesus talked of two different paths to eternity. There is the narrow way that leads to life. There's also the broad way that leads to destruction. Jesus said, very few find the narrow way. He said, many are on the broad way. The narrow way is difficult. You must strive to enter it. I believe here the context is in the fact that there are false teachers standing in front of the narrow way saying it's not here, it's, not here, it's there. So if you want to know the true way, you're going to have to diligently search the scriptures to test every man's teaching. The broad way is easy. Follow anyone other than the Lord Jesus and you will be on the broad way. The narrow way is by God's grace and his righteousness. The broad way is by good works and self-righteousness. All the religions of the world preach a works righteousness salvation. The Roman Catholic religion is no different. My last semester at Dallas Seminary, I put together these two paths to eternity. We have been sharing these paths with Roman Catholics for the last 22 years. Every time we share it, Roman Catholics say, yes, that is the path I'm on. That's what I've been taught. And that path shows that they are born destined for hell. But through the sacrament of water baptism, they're placed on the road to heaven. As they commit those venial sins, they lose some of their right standing before God. When they commit a mortal sin, they're void of grace, destined for hell. Only by doing good works and receiving sacraments can they produce the merit necessary to gain eternal life. You see the treasury there, it's actually invisible in Rome. It is said to contain the inexhaustible, infinite merits of Christ, commingled with Mary's merits and all those that died with more than enough merit to qualify them for heaven. This is where indulgences come in. The Pope has the power to transfer these merits to those who are suffering in purgatory, and he refuses to do so unless mass cards are purchased in the person's name. At the end of a Catholic's life, if he's never heard the gospel or if he's heard it and rejected it, he will stand before the Lord Jesus at the great white throne and he will hear the most sobering words anyone could ever hear when he says, depart from me, I never knew you. And they're cast into the eternal lake of fire. It is for this reason I have such a compassion for Roman Catholics. I was a victim of deception for over 30 years. You and I have been entrusted with the true gospel. We've been entrusted with the truth of God's word. We need to reach out to those on the broad road and show them the narrow way. It's not water baptism. It's faith in Jesus Christ. At that moment of justification, we begin the process of sanctification. At the end of a believer's life, hopefully we will hear the words, well done, my good and faithful servant, as we meet the Lord Jesus at the Bema seat. These two paths to eternity are available in our gospel tract that Tommy was referring to. And I really encourage you, if you know Roman Catholics, to get a copy of this, get a package of them and share them because they will see that a picture is worth a thousand words, that they are indeed on the wrong path to eternity. So in closing then, what is the Christian's responsibility in these last days, God's holy word gives constant warnings to the church to be on guard against doctrinal defection, which leads to apostasy. Christians are to stand firm on the truth of God's word 
and be sober and alert, lest we be swept away by the growing wave of apostasy in the last days. We must speak the truth in love when anyone willfully misrepresents the authority or the character of God or his attributes. It is the duty of every Christian to know, to proclaim, to guard and defend the truth of God's word. To do nothing shows either an indifference toward the Lord Jesus Christ or a greater loyalty to another person or another institution. If you want to go deeper into understanding the Roman Catholic religion, I would encourage you to stop by our resource table. There's a book that I have written, Preparing for Eternity. We have a new publisher, Northampton Press. I am their only living author. I'm not sure that's such a good thing. But no, they are known for reprinting the works of the Puritans. And so I encourage you to reach out to this huge mission field. I'm not suggesting for a moment that everyone in the Roman Catholic religion is lost. There are born-again Christians that have not been led out by the spirit of truth. This is why the Lord Jesus gave us the Great Commission, not to go and make decisions, but to go and make disciples, teaching them to observe everything Christ has commanded, including worshiping God in spirit and in truth. We must teach them and let the Spirit draw them out. Thank you so much for the opportunity to share this great burden.